but uh, I'm glad to be back here. I think that works, yeah. And uh, I'm excited about the new book. It's a different book. Uh, has anybody read it yet at all? No? It's a completely different style of book. The other ones are more suspenseful, fast, right? Boom, 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 there's action. You know, <clears throat> this one is more uh, a different pace. Basically, what this book does is it goes back 25 years to when Carlos was a new and uh, young and handsome agent, okay? And uh, he started at the FBI Academy. And you all, for those of you, how many of you have read the other three? Most of you have, right? Uh, okay. You've read the first two? Yeah. Okay. Um, Carlos can be a little difficult, right? So in this one, Carlos has trouble at the FBI Academy to get through the Academy. They don't care for him very much. And uh, so they, they try to jam him up and try to boot him from the Academy. Of course, we know that he's going to make it through there, right? Because we know from the other books he, he gets through. Uh, but then he makes some enemies along the way that go to his first assignment. And when he gets to his first assignment, uh, they're, out to, they're gunning for him. So as an FBI agent, he's on probation for a year. And basically, you can be fired for anything that first year. Uh, and so he's fighting, which is, by the way, that's a theme you see throughout the other three books, right? He's fighting his own people, and he's fighting the bad guys, right? So that kind of, that kind of element is still in this book, which is exciting. And it's true, because sometimes your biggest enemy is your own bureaucracy. Um, so he goes on to get a, a case. They basically, the whole premise of the book is, this is a case that um, they think is really a nothing case. We're going to give him this case, and he's going to fail. And it turns out the case is far more serious than what it appeared to be at first. And it appears basically there's a woman who has a miscarriage, and then following, this is, by the way, is based on actual things that happened, OK? The lady has a miscarriage, and then she gets a satanic letter in the mail. Um, and then a second lady has the same problem. And so he starts looking into this, and he, he befriends a detective that's working this as well, um, who ends up being a, an ally of his in this. And they discover that these aren't just accidents, that these women are being poisoned. And, uh, and it's just, I can't give it away. So it's basically him investigating this case of a group that call themselves the Devil's Henchmen. That's where the title comes from. Uh, it's a group of young men, and they're really, really uh, just evil people who enjoy suffering. And uh, for those of you that recall the characters, not only is Carlos in this book, but so obviously is his buddy uh, Conrad. Everybody remember him? It's the sidekick. Well, Conrad and him, if you remember from the first novels, they grew up together. They were kind of family. So in, in the novel, and which follows the same line of reasoning as the other books, is they were at the academy at the same time. So, so Carlos has Conrad at the academy. Uh, he's, he's, I think, one class after Sullivan. So Sullivan graduates first uh, and gets posted. And then Conrad graduates two weeks later. Um, and then when he's at his new office, which is in New Haven, this all happens in Connecticut. So in Connecticut, he's assigned to New Haven. That's where he meets uh, Trish. Remember Trish, the analyst? So the analyst, Trish, is actually a young intern at that time. So it kind of brings them all into how they met. And so that's kind of what's cool about it, OK? So it's, it's more of a, of a story of, uh, of how they met. So what I want to do is one of you loan me a copy. I want to read a passage from it, give you an idea of the flavor for this one, OK? Uh, by the way, I dedicated this to uh, 50 cops that I met last year. I spent uh, three months with these officers at the FBI Academy. Their picture, I don't know if you've flipped through it yet. Mm -hmm. I'm in there, actually, if you look hard enough, uh, in there with these guys. This was us doing a physical fitness training. And uh, so I dedicated it to them because I, I, I really love them. And we still stay in touch. Um, 
So let's see here. I'm going to go to page. Uh, all right. So I'll read you a quick passage. How's that sound? Right? Something I don't usually do, right? It's exciting, <laughs> right? Hear it in the author's voice. So the backstory of this sequence here is he's in trouble at the academy and he's having trouble sleeping. He's going to be on a, they're going to basically put him on trial the next morning. Uh, and that's where this takes off right here, okay? So that evening, once all were asleep, Sullivan struggled to doze off. He lay in bed, eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. Turley snored lightly. Sullivan envied his friend's peaceful sl slumber. That's his roommate. Sullivan envied his friend's peaceful slum slumber. He checked the clock, which read 2.12 a.m. Quietly, Sullivan slipped out of bed and put on his sneakers. He walked down the hall and took the stairs to the first floor, avoiding the noisy, clunky elevator. <laughs> Once outside, he headed for Hogan's Alley. The FBI created Hogan's Alley in 1987 as a training tool. It is a fake town, complete with a bank, pharmacy, motel, movie theater, and apartment buildings, all designed for recreating crime scenarios. The bank has been dubbed the, quote, most robbed bank in the world, end quote. During the day, paid actors commit different crimes while the agent trainees conduct investigations to include surveillances and arrests. It is not uncommon for observers and visitors to hear agents shouting at the actors during the scenarios. Hogan's Alley is usually a beehive of activity. Now, in the dead of night, only crickets could be heard. In 1993, the area around Quantico was relatively undeveloped. As a result, the night sky was alive with light. Sullivan made his way to the one-story motel, the Dogwood Inn. He knew from one of his training sessions that the back door did not lock. He slipped inside and found a staircase, which led to a trap door and then the roof. He thought it humorous that he was now actually committing an offense that could get him in trouble. He was sure Nuggle would love to see him climbing up to the roof. Once on top of the motel, Sullivan lay down on the brown, slanted roof. In the clear, cloudless night sky, Sullivan was in, the, the, in a real-life planetarium. Thousands of blinking lights illuminated the night. As he watched the cosmos in wonderment, he pondered the nature of his existence. In such a limitless universe, what role could he have to play? He left Hogan's Alley that night with the belief that he was destined to do some good in the world. Whether that would be within the FBI was the only thing left to be decided. Okay? Was it all right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's a real place. That's a real place. Yeah. Do These are all real places. Do you have to get your books cleared? Yes. Yeah. So everything's cleared. Um, people can visit Hogan's Alley. If you know someone, you go, go get a tour. Yeah. We know someone. <laughs> you do know someone. You, you should have come down. I was, there I was there from September to December. We I was staying down. there. <laughs> so, and. I went there when I just I, when I was just there. Uh, it's almost the same. It's almost identical as it was uh, 30 years ago when I came through. Uh, they've added a couple of uh, they added a cul-de-sac with homes, so there's actually houses now. Um, they added a, yeah, so homes and they added uh, a new business I think like a laundromat, but pretty much it's all it's all fake. The only thing that's real there is there's a subway and that actually has an actual subway. Uh, that's in the town, and that's for people to get lunch. Um, but the rest <laughs> is for <fake. laughs> Subway restaurant. Restaurant. Subway oh, restaurant. Yeah. No, 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 no. Subway restaurant. That would be cool. <laughs> that would be very cool. But that would be, as we would say, wicked expensive, right? <laughs> so we, we couldn't do that. But yeah, there's a Subway restaurant, and, and everybody's like, oh, we even have a fake Subway restaurant. No, that's real. Yeah. That's, how, that's the only thing that's real. So, so the, 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 the fun part of the book is as it leads to a culmination. And this is a quick read. This is not Coyote Wars. Coyote, Coyote Wars was a much longer book, OK? This is more of a, a, a shorter novel, if you will, OK? It kind of sets the stage for everything else. Now, one of the interesting things is people that have read it have told me that you can actually read this one first, because it is a prequel. Uh, you can read this one first. And so for those of you that are maybe recommending the series, to someone, it's perfectly okay to recommend this one first 
and it kind of shows the characters early on, and then it can take off from there for the for the other ones. So, what was that? What was that? Okay. So, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of, of. So the problem is, I don't want to give what happens away. So, Carlos comes up with a plan essentially to uh, to catch these guys. And it's, of course, an unorthodox plan. And he actually ends up getting in trouble as a result of that. But he makes a friend in the supervisor that's his supervisor. And uh, actually based on a character that I know, it was a supervisor back then. It was a really good guy. And this guy kind of uh, kind of protects Carlos in a way. Carlos is making mistakes. The good thing about this book is different. Because in the other ones, Carlos, not only is he cocky, right, but he doesn't make a lot of big mistakes, right? So in this book, he's starting out. He doesn't know what he's doing, really. You know, He's kind of winging it. You know, Yeah, he has his training, but he's still brand new. He makes mistakes. And uh, he's, you know, to that extent, he's more a human, a uh, younger kid. And so I kind of I kind of like that part of it, and I like that Trish. She meets Trish. Trish is an intern, and she decides she's going to help him in the case too. So she jumps in there, uh, and it's I think it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Any questions about that? How much do you identify with Carlos? Well, I I like Carlos. You know, I created a character that, uh, in some respects, uh, somebody might recognize mm -hmm. if they knew me. All right, but uh, obviously it's fictionalized. You know. If they knew you, but. No, me. Oh, it is just yeah. yeah. Well, people say yeah. it's me. I, I get that all the time. But you, you're going to go on characters that you're most familiar with, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm probably more familiar with myself than anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but I was going to ask, how many of these characters are like based on yes. people that you actually know? So all the good guys are based on people I know. Well, you know. All right. <laughs> so Trish is based on an analyst I work with. Uh, Co Conrad, he's actually in town this week. Uh, we went out last night. He's an agent I've known forever. Um, so you go down the line. Um, I created a character, Suzanne, in the second one. Uh, the cyber sleuth. Yeah. She's a friend of mine. Um, Jamie Bank oh, Banks. I think he was the Denver agent in the breakout one. He's a friend of mine. So I, all the characters are based on, on somebody that I know. So and I, I usually, if I use their name, like the character of, of Detective Dominguez. Remember him, the Boston detective? Boston, yeah. So he's a friend of mine, really great guy. He's retired, Boston cop. So because I use his name Dominguez, I ask for his permission. Because it really looks, it's him. You know what I'm saying? Oh. So it's too close to that. So, so if I do it, if I actually describe you and name you, then I would ask for permission. Like I asked Trish for permission to use her, and she loved it. So yeah, she didn't love how she died, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> She, to this day, I never hear the end of it. Like, how could you kill me that way? Right. I said, I had to do it. I had to do it. That's, that's your real name? Those are real names? Trish. Like, change. do you change a little bit? Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, just one second. So, for example, the two teachers, you remember the, Ips, the I th was it the second or the third? The third one, for those who read the third one. Remember the bus gets kidnapped? Yes with the students from Ipswich. Now, Ipswich is a school that's uh, kind of adopted me. I just was there last month. I go every year. So I made the teachers. So instead of Mary Ham, that's her real name, in the book is Mary Hamlin. And uh, so it's obviously her. And so they loved it. They thrilled, you know, because I made them into these heroes and everything. Yeah. So, the, you know, the, the school's thrilled about that. And, you know, it's just fun to do that. Why not? You know, especially when I'm making them in the positive light, sure. right? There's a couple of bad su supervisors that are not uh, in a positive light, but those are real too. <laughs> <laughs> they know they know who they are. <laughs> they know who they are. No, because they're bad guys. So too bad. And uh, people always joke about that. Don't piss Mike off. He's going to make you a character in his book. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes, you had a question. Yeah. A lot of people said to you, well, 
Well, we want to know more about the background, so you decided. That's a great question. So essentially, uh, look, when I did Coyote Wars, I thought that was it. I, I didn't plan on doing any. I, that was the thing. I was check off my bucket list. Okay, I wrote a book. Now I can go surf and go <laughs> to ho go to Mount Everest or something. And but then you know I started going around and people liked it. They're like, you got to do another book. And, and it's really my sister's fault because she, when I was trying to come up with the title of the Coyote Wars, and we all know why it's called the Coyote Wars, right? It has nothing to do with coyotes, right? It's about the terrorists called themselves the coyotes. Uh, my sister says, you know, you should leave room for a sequel. And instead of the Coyote War, make it the Coyote Wars. So I said, all right, what's one letter? We'll call it the Coyote Wars. It kind of rolls off the tongue easier. So then that, and then later when people liked the Coyote Wars and they said, you got to do a sequel, I'm like, well, all right, let's do the sequel. Because really there are things that are left hanging in the first one, right? Um, so I kind of had the idea I would do a sequel, at least one. But then one became three, and then people were like, well, we want another one. <laughs> so I'm like, well, if you look at how the Coyote Rising ended, right, can we do another one from that? No. no, right? That has to be left like that, right? By the way, is Sully still alive or not? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's up to the reader to decide. Yeah. What do you think? You think Joanne thinks so? <laughs> all right. Well, people ask me all the time. I go, I don't know. It's a tough one. So I, om I was very tempted in, the, in this one to add something that would give a hint to weather, <laughs> but I thought I'd leave it alone. <laughs> I'd leave it alone. Because I'd rather it up to, up to the reader uh, is to, you know, is, is the camp's divided. I have some people say, no, he's dead. Well, other people, no, he's alive. So, yes, you had a question? And, well, with the coyotes, just after this, and then the coyote was finished, that group couldn't have launched another? Thing? Well, a whole nother, that would be a whole nother universe. <coughs> yeah. I don't know that I'm that talented. Huh? You should be going with these main characters. Correct. So with this line of characters, I think we've run its course. I think we have run its course. I mean, I don't see any other. I mean. You get a whole span of time in between, though, don't you? Between the Coyote Wars and then this book, the new book. Well, because. And in between it, you can write books. Well, no. Coyote Wars was in 2014. Then the last Coyote was 2015. Right, but I mean, and so there's one every year. Ago, right? This, book is, Th this is set in the past. Right. Yes, yeah, so I could do other stories in between. In between. Yeah, so it could be a second case. Yeah. You know, I could do his. Yeah, I mean, I could do a whole nother. No, that is true. Very good, thanks. <laughs> I mean, I, t I tell people, you know, I do have a full time job. You know, it's like, it's like why don't you do more books? Well, I have a job, I'm, I've got to work. So, but that's good. That's absolutely true. So I could do, a, say, another ten books of, of his adventures leading up to the Coyote Wars. Thanks for the idea. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how I feel. We'll see how I feel. Are the stories something that you researched or that you personally know about? Well, in this it's case, not. so this particular story line was a case that I was given when I first became an agent. And I, I figured out who did it, but I could never prove it. So this was my way of resolving it in real, in, for my satisfaction. So I knew it wasn't a big overt plot. Obviously, you have to dramatize things for the book. So there was uh, uh, people that were receiving these letters, uh, satanic letters. Imagine you've just had lost a baby, and you're getting these letters. Who is so sick to do this? It made me so angry. Uh, and I figured out who did it, and I, and I was so angry because I didn't have enough evidence. This was before DNA and other things that you would have today, maybe, you know. Um, I had handwriting samples, I had a bunch of stuff. I, I couldn't put it together enough for an, in, uh, an indictment. But I knew who it was, and, that, and I, can, you know, I went after the person, and I made their life miserable. Um, and it stopped. So to the extent that it stopped, and he knew I was on to him, it was a success, right? Can't always prove it, right? That's how it works in this country. You gotta prove it, right? So 
uh, it just frustrated me. So, I, so that's why I decided to make that this case for, this, for his first case. But in this one, he's, he resolves it, I think. <laughs> but it's how he resolves it that that's what's interesting. So hopefully you'll, hopefully you'll like what he does and, you know, pisses off his management. Okay. And there's a story in there, just real quick, a vignette. So the reason he gets in trouble, so he pisses off these people at the account because he's kind of cocky, right? And they don't like that in the FBI. For they like you to be very submissive at the academy. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yeah, I, I, I don't like that. Don't, that's not. So he kind of upsets people. And then he goes to help this lady. This lady had her purse stolen. This is a true story. This actually happened to me. So this lady had her purse stolen. And it was a, a Kate Spade bag. Ever heard of this? Yeah, Kate Spade. Yes. When this first happened, I'm like, what's, what's a Kate Spade bag? <laughs> Who is Kate the Spade? Designer. Right. So you now she's famous because she died, right? Everyone's famous when they die. So she died. Anyway, so this is true story. So the lady, this lady in the office has her story. Uh, not a, it wasn't at Quantico that happened, but it happened in the office. In, in one of my FBI offices. So it's stolen by a coworker. Okay? A Kate Spade bag. She crying. I see this girl crying. I go, what happened? She said, oh, my Kate Spade bag's gone. I go, what? It was on my desk. I went to lunch and, and it's gone. I, go, oh, I'm I knew who it was, by the way. I said, I suspect. I said, we're going to get you. I can get you the. I said, I can't get you the bag back, but I can get you. Her concern is her keys her wallet, and her credit cards, and stuff. Mm -hmm. And she only had one key to uh, their car, and, and all this, she had to get a ride home. So I said, I can get you the keys and, and the ID back. He goes, you can? I go, yeah. I said, I'm gonna put an email out telling people, for the whole office, whoever borrowed this so-and-so's bag, she had her keys in there, and so I made it, I appealed to that. Just as I predicted, the next day, the items were left on her desk. So I took that, that what that happened, and I transformed it into the scene at this academy 25 years before. Now this is before emails, right? So in the book, he writes a memo and plasters it all over the academy to get her things back. And they use that against him because he didn't have permission. And he used an official memo and he discriminated it and he didn't get permission to do that. So they use that against him to try to kick him out. So we see how we have to figure out how he gets out of that. So they, they, they actually have a trial and this is how it works in real life. They put, basically put you on trial before board. And the sentence is almost always the same. Guilty. Of guilty and <laughs> exactly, 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 Craig. But somehow Carlos has nine lives and he gets out of that. So it's, but it's fine. So when you see that story, you, now you know that's based on a real story. You know? And she's like, how do you do that? I go, because I know how bad guys think. She doesn't want to think she's a bad person. She wanted the bag. I said, that's why I said to her, first of all, it's a woman that did it. Yeah. And second, and she, second she wanted the bag. She doesn't want your keys and all. Yeah. So by giving you back the keys and your ID, she yeah. feels better yeah. about herself. Yeah. You know, like, I'm not a bad person. See, I gave it back. <laughs> you know, I could predict exactly what was going to happen. But I only kicked myself that we didn't put a camera on her desk. Right. So we could, you know, yeah. catch her. But see, this is what's so crazy. This is in the FBI. She ended up getting caught stealing some other things later she and got her. fired. It was a big scandal. But th there's nothing, no one's immune. Mm -hmm. right? There's bad guys everywhere. Yeah. Was there anything besides that you wanted to complete something on your to-do list, reasons for why you wrote? And then secondly, who did you find? How did you find your, your person Well, those are two good questions. The first one is I would always thought about writing a book. I probably would have been a, just a writer if I hadn't gone into the I wanted to go into journalism, 
or writing. And so, I, but I decided, no, FBI is maybe more fun. So uh, that's why I, I did it. So I basically, I had this concept for the book for 20 plus years. And my sister and I had to challenge each other about who was gonna write a book first. And I said, well, I've got the storyline in mind, and it's the Coyote War story, remember? The swapping out an agent for somebody. And that led to the Coyote Wars. In terms of the, the publishing, I, I, I cannot go, because I'm still an FBI employee, I cannot go and ha have a book contract with a publishing house, because that would violate my uh, employment terms. I'm limited in what I can do for post-employment. Uh, I can only make, uh, the contract would have to be less than $1,500. What's the point, okay? With this Amazon platform, there's no contract. It's, it's, it's whoever purchases, it purchases. And the, I don't have to tell the Bureau anything. So if I, had a, if I were to do a contract, which I may do after I retire, I'd have to disclose, you know, I'd have to go to the Bureau and say, and they, would, they wouldn't accept it because I'm not allowed to make more than $1,500 a year outside. <laughs> so, so all these restrictions. So that's why Amazon was perfect for me for this. And so that's, I, I'm like, okay, all right. And then when I found this platform, I forget somebody told me about it. And it's, it's so easy. And, uh, and, it's, and it's so, th th Amazon just direct deposits my royalties. Mm. So then there's no contract that I have to disclose. Did your sister so write her book? She did not. <laughs> she did not, which I tease her to this day. Her idea, she claims, her idea was to, because she visits my mom at the uh, nursing home. You know, oh. If you read this, you know my mom is in a nursing home, right? So I think there's a sec section about Alzheimer's yeah. in there. I think Carl goes to visit. His mom's got Alzheimer's. So her story was, all these people have stories. And I'm going to interview the family and tell stories about it was kind of convoluted, like, like tell stories of the people that were in the home, like what their lives were, and somehow go back and forth in time. It didn't work out. Yeah. But that's good. I can still tease her. So. <laughs> in movies, but the same law. So, yeah, so I couldn't even, like if they had, I would, okay, so if I were to be approached and say, hey, we want to do your book into a movie, I mean, anything's possible, right? I would have to, I would, I would just retire at that point. I'd say, okay, now I can retire. So I'm like, bye-bye. Right, Once I'm retired, I can do whatever I want. So that's why I had toyed with the idea of, um, of uh, like a novel about like, some of the real cases. You know yeah, how. You talked about that. No. So, talked about that so that's in the works. It's still in the works. Good. It's called Confessions to the FBI. And that we're looking for a publishing house for that because that way it will be retired then, and in that the other two and agents that won't be issue. Too? There's another agent that wants to go Only in one? in with it, yeah. So you still have to get it though. Um, still, even after you retire, you still have to get it approved. But the money is not an issue. No. You can make all the money you want. Yeah, because what's his name? Uh, who was on S Stephen Colbert? Who got fired from the FBI? He McCabe. McCabe. He had to have his book still approved. Well, he said he, even like these are the people. Did. Remember, you know how I'm always talking about these FBI crazy people that know. This is the example. They're real life. They're horrible. Some of these people are horrible. Mm -hmm. He's a perfect example. You know, and then now he's out getting rich, selling books, and you know, gets fired for lying. You know, and, and for leaking, and for leaking. lying, leaking. All these people, all these executives, they should fire all of them. That's why oh, I put me in charge. Give me ten. <laughs> yeah. I, give me two weeks. I clean house. Yeah. Clean house. We Everybody's heard, fired. We heard Start that over before. again. <laughs> yeah. But and, and it's a pattern of it. It's a pattern. All these people, they're just not uh, not oh, very uh, reliable people. Right. And and that's some one of the things about the FBI is the higher you go, is the worse people are. You know, the good guys tend to stay on the street. Yes. Yeah, sure. What do you want to know? I mean, I'm, uh, I am literally the expert on I, life I know, detection. Um, 
And by the way, that intro is old because I, I just counted my tests. I got over 2,500 tests now already. Wow. So I'm, I'm actually closing in on 3,000 probably before I retire. Well, you know how uh, the equality crime story brought the feds in a bit. Um, some people can beat those because they're such um, sociopaths okay. that it, they don't show any emotion whether they're lying or well, not. Well, the, here's the thing about that. There's yeah. two things. Yeah. First of all, you, the, the, if it's an inexperienced examiner, it's possible you may be able to get one over on them. Poorly trained or inexperienced, okay? Then this, this instrument, you call it a machine. You're not supposed to call it a machine. We're not supposed to call it a machine, okay? When you're at the polygraph school, if you call it a machine, they make you put a dollar in the jar, okay? <laughs> you have to call it an instrument, whatever. I said, who cares? It is what it is. But if you have a an experienced person, so it's only as effective as a person administering the test. Okay, that's what I'm going to say. If you're an experienced uh, investigator uh, who's done so many of these, you're not going to beat my test. Okay, and for in terms of the sociopath issue, the one thing you have to remember: sociopaths. They don't care about what they did, but they care about themselves. Most importantly. So because of that, the concern for consequences impacts them during a polygraph. So uh, their concern is if they get detected, they will have to suffer consequences. And they don't want to have to suffer consequences. That's why the polygraph is still a very effective for, for them. Because the fear is of detection. Okay? And it's still valid for them, if more, maybe even more for them. So it's, very effective. It's a good thing too, because sociopaths are very, very common. And not. And by the way, this is what I explained to people. Sociopaths are not all criminals. Some of them go into like politics. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously. You uh, <laughs> politics. They go into medicine. They become doctors because what? Doctors of God, right? They go into all these uh, many professors. Become professors, right? Where people have to sit there and listen to them, right? And then. To, and then students have to go and buy their book at $50 at the bookstore, right? And every year they change the edition and all they do is they switch chapters around, right? And so they go into all these professors, look, she's shaking her, she, Kate, yeah, right? Absolutely. Kate knows what I'm talking every about. Single year of my undergrad. Right? Know, yeah. and, and is that the most ridiculous thing? And it's a scam and they know it and they're lining their pockets and a lot of these people, so they go into these professions, so they, it's not people think, oh, sociopath criminal. Could be criminal, but not in the sense of Hannibal Lecter. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, so they, they are very smart people. And so many of them go into these professions. And law enforcement. Who has power? Law enforcement. So they like power. So some of them are cops. Some of them are in the FBI. <laughs> Guess what? Okay. And so it, there's nothing immune. There's no, there's no profession immune from it. But I do tend to see them more in professions of fame and attention, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But that was a very, very good question. So the answer is yes. And in terms of stories, I mean, uh, what, what, how much time do we have? I mean, po polygraphs. You could solve so many things, anything. You, I mean, or you can exonerate someone. Uh, on Monday, I was up in Maine, and a lady was accused of something. And a uh, very nice lady. I knew right away. I said, "This is something's wrong here," and uh, I cleared her. She's very happy, very happy with Carlos. I mean, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so it's a very powerful thing when you clear somebody. Those are very, very rewarding tests, right? Mm -hmm. And it was because the investigators did a horrible job. You know, they don't want they don't want to hear that. Too bad. It is what it is. So yeah. I feel like there are a lot of times in courtrooms they don't always uh, allow them. Okay. For evidence. So they're not they're not allowed as evidence. But the whole point of the polygraph is to get a confession, and the confession is admissible. So the only thing is the jury, if there is a trial, is not told about the exam, the polygraph, but they are presented with the signed confession. Okay. I've been to trial many many times. Okay, some famous ones. You may recall the Marathon bombing. Mm -hmm. The friend of the Marathon bomber, I polygraphed him. He, f he, uh, fail he had lied to investigators. He gave me a two-page statement. 
that statement became the basis of the trial. Guess who won? I won. So then it's an attack on me. Did you coerce him? Did you force him? And so the more that you can prove that didn't happen, the better for the trial. But so that's the point. So yeah, the polygraph, but who cares? It's not admissible. And it shouldn't be admissible. It's not a perfect tool. So, you know, it, it doesn't rise to the standard of, say, DNA, right? DNA now, you can almost 99.9% .9 that Lucy did this, yeah. okay? I had to pick Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> I had to pick Lucy. And we believe but with polygraph, there's that level of certainty is not there, especially because there are too many differing standards of training, okay? You can go to a school in a week in some places and be trained, okay? The school that we have to go to is three months long. And it's very vigorous and rigorous. And we have uh, quality review people that have to review our, every single one of my tests has to be looked at before it's rendered definitive. So you can go to be private examiner and have no restrictions or restraints and no training, practically, and you're a train wreck. And that person, imagine, and you, so that's why you can't have that. I, I'm totally agreement that it should not be to that level of, of being uh, admissible in court. Fair enough? Yeah. Good questions today. I'm exhausted. Where's my, is it nap time? Yeah. I need a nap. I find the older I get, I like naps in the afternoon. Is that crazy? No. No. Right? <laughs> so I didn't ever used to drink coffee. I've never been a coffee drinker. Now I'm in the afternoon now, once in a while, I'm like, I'm gonna get a coffee. Because I have two choices, either take a nap or have a coffee, right? So, what are we thinking? Are we excited? We have a, a quick little read to, you're gonna yeah. get through this book in no time. And you're gonna be like, oh, we need more. Right. I already heard it already. Well, yeah. we more, where's the next one coming? Yeah, so so. So you all want to be a cat? Well, you know what? Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll have like a terrorist group take over the Quesit House. Yeah. There's gonna be an event, and Kate is at the door, and these terrorists barge in. Yeah. At a library. Library terrorists. You don't see a lot of terrorists in libraries. No. Oh. But they do. Shoot in, in libraries, really? Oh, I've never heard of that. Not here, not in Massachusetts. No. No. no um, recently, though, several. Mm. Yeah. Very exciting. Is that your address? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And your name's on there? Uh, yeah, everything's on there. All right, I'll get that to you. Oh, okay. But you give me your name. No. Fuck no. it, it's my fault. Yes. Oh boy. <laughs> Why are you in the back? <laughs> All right. Well, what what you're referring to is familial DNA, mm -hmm. okay? Now, familial DNA is very controversial, okay? Because basically, if you, let's say, submit your DNA for a genealogical, right, because you want to see where, where you're from. Like, my daughter did this, right? I did. Ancestry. You did this. Did. Ancestry, all these things. So guess what? Your DNA is now on a database, all right? But guess what? You also have family, right, that share your DNA traits. So let's say you didn't do anything, but your nephew did. Okay, and they find that, wait a minute, the person that did this crime has a familial link to, what's your name? Karen. To Karen. So we know it's not Karen, but Karen has a family member that must have done this. So now, you see this could be a problem, okay? Now they come to you, tell me who your family members are. Okay, there's no database that counts all your family, right? They gotta get it from you, or they gotta ask your neighbors. Who does she know? Who's her son? Who, does, who is her siblings? So it creates this whole drama. So someone who never submitted their DNA. Now, if you submit it and you commit a crime, well, that's dumb on you, OK? That's your mistake. But if now someone else can get, you know, 
it would be almost like having everybody required to, to give fingerprints. And that kind of goes against our theory as free people, right, in America. So it's controversial. But the more that we see, there's no real, I don't see any real breakthroughs coming, but I think that the more people submit to these things, the more crimes are going to be solved. Because think of it like a tree, right? And every person that submits now, all your family members are now in, really in the system through you. That's why I don't, I don't, I don't take these tests. You're not putting I don't, your name. I'm not putting my name. <laughs> <laughs> your daughter took it, so you're in. My dad's true. <laughs> she, Mona brings up a good point. My daughter put it, so so come back to me yeah. through her. So very good. I'm gonna have to kill her. <laughs> yeah. how, how far fetched do you think these shows are, like NCIS or Criminal Minds, when they have those people? Who Completely like far fetched. And and I just started watching this other one, the FBI one. FBI. And it's like, Completely ridiculous. Okay, first of all, and then uh, did anybody watch last night's episode? And you yes. with him? Okay. Oh, the, the FBI. The one with it was the kind of the PC women power one, yes, and yeah. it's like, it. oh, oh, women are mistreated in the FBI. Oh, give me a break. Okay, it's so ridiculous. Okay, women rise through the ranks without any problem in the FBI. Try to say it's the same as corporate America. I don't know how corporate America is. I don't know. But the th idea that they're second class citizens in the FBI, or that she took, in one case, she took a, a comment and she didn't like a comment, they, they uh, well, you're always gonna get a comment. You know, get over it. But it's so ridiculous. They have the SAC, the SAC of the office is this Celia Ward, right? Beautiful, right? She's very beautiful. That's the first thing. She, we don't have beautiful SACs. Okay. <laughs> okay. She, she's gorgeous. I have yet to see an SAC that pretty. <laughs> doesn't happen, okay? See, now I'm being sexist, but it is what it is. Uh, so they have her in the show, there's a crime, right? Always starts with a crime, right? Whether it's a bombing or a murder right. or this. <coughs> and the SAC's in there, in the trenches, making, you know, in the decision, okay, do this and do that. And wait, wait a minute, wait, that, that's ridiculous. The SAC is not, the investigator is not in the, in the bullpen, you know, sending agents here. Mm. That's not his job, okay? <laughs> yeah, so it's completely so unrealistic. We don't know no, I know you don't know right. that. So but they portray it as if the head of the mm -hmm. office, imagine, the head of the, is the one assigning that leads in this investigation. Yeah. That's completely absurd. It's like that show, well, even like, I love Blue Bloods. I love that show too. But it's even like Danny. He's always, he's everywhere in the whole city. And he's killing people all the time. But he's also, he's on every single place in the whole city. There's no one for this place. He's always the one. Yeah. I love a body count of these shows. Does anybody watch this? The other one I, I like, and I only like it because I like the scenery in Hawaii. Oh, right. Hawaii Five-O. Oh, yeah. That is the most ridiculous. Which one? Everybody yeah, likes Alex Obama. They love him. And that's fine. That's a good reason. Th that I get. Like, for me, I like the scenery, especially in the winter. I envision myself oh, yeah. in the, you know, this beautiful, tropical, lush, green. And so I wa but have you really sat, if you sat in that, that show, that body count, like everyone's dying. Like, I'm like, do I really want to go to Hawaii? It's so, so dangerous. Like, terrorists are blowing it up. R bank robberies in the middle of the day. It's like over the top. And, and I love this, the, the scenarios with the with the interrogations, they have them in this chair in the middle of an empty room, <laughs> right? Have you seen that? This chained. Yeah, but then they had all the poisonous gas. In the and the poisonous <laughs> gas. <laughs> as I've never seen an interrogation room as big as this, they're always this big, and then with one chair in the middle. Yeah, like a warehouse. <laughs> what is that? It's <laughs> so crazy. Where are you going to sit? Why would I stand for the interrogation? <laughs> While you sit. If you think about it, an interrogation room, you've got to have chairs for the interrogators. Right? But in, the, in their interrogation room, the interrogators have to poorly have to stand up. I'm not standing up for two or three hours. So but that's fine. They're not in there two or three hours. It's like five minutes. Well, oh, they get it. Like, well, boom. We only have an hour. They got to solve it in an hour. <laughs> right. Got to solve it in an hour. So in the Criminal Minds one, the one that gets me, Criminal Minds, they're like, okay, we have a case. Boom, boom, they go around the table. All right, wheels up in 20. Wheels up in 20. How are you getting to the airport 
in 20 minutes. It does, takes you that long just to get to the parking lot, okay? And then to, you get a drive. We don't have an airport at the academy. So where are they going for this airport in the middle of nowhere? You know, it's, it's so bizarre. And they don't have their own plane. That unit doesn't have its own plane. Yeah, so they have you seen the plane they have? It's like a, it's like a corporate luxury jet. You know, they've all got their armrests and first class, and the only thing that's missing is, you know, like, waitresses and stuff. But it's, it's just ridiculous, so. Uh, they're all, to some degree, ridiculous. Blue Bloods is probably my favorite. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yes. I know. I like Jamie. I like Jamie a lot. Yes. For those of you that show that are up there, Mm -hmm. and all that. Is that like pretty much close to what's, you know, the truth of what they tell you in those shows of what happened or how they happened and all that? Well, if it's a documentary, the ones yeah. that are documentaries? Mm -hmm. I, I've just been hooked on watching those. Which one is, are these like, you know, is this like a dateline or? Yeah, like smiley face killer. Yeah, those are pretty, those, those are. They had a couple in Boston. Yeah, those are pretty accurate. They're they based on the case files and. Files yeah, the, they have like there was an R. Kelly one that yeah. Lifetime did yes. that ended up getting him jammed up because they said, oh wait, let's look at this. And yeah. he ended up now getting charged, charged yeah. after, oh, no. this, <laughs> after this, after yeah. this, uh, I don't want anybody making a show about me. I mean, every, everybody gets in trouble. It's crazy, but this guy needs yeah. to go to jail. Can we agree? Yeah. I mean, very creepy yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah. And he got away with it for a long time. Oh yeah, they they so they know about the kid. Oh, they, okay, but they're trying to solve it. Yes, yeah, yeah. cold cases. Cold cases. Yeah, well, they're good for that reason. They're actually literally trying to solve the case. So, so those case facts are going to be very accurate, I think. Yeah. If you ever want to see a really incredible uh, TV series, I love the British Mystery if you like it. What's that? There's a place, there's a thing called Waking the Dead. Waking the Dead. Eve is a star of it, and um, you have to get it by. I got it through the system, the library system, but it's all about cold cases. And it's a, a forensic psychologist is the person who's on the, I actually think, I don't know if you've had to work with forensic psychologists that much, but do, you know, they sort of like get- um, There's like profilers? Profilers, do you work with profilers? I have, I have. There's a chapter on profiling in, uh, was it The Last Coyote, I think? They use profiling for the second book, in my yeah, second right. book. Yeah. They use profiling for, um, to try to catch uh, Alexa, right. who's the last coyote. Look, a lot of what behavioral scientists are, do is uh, just a lot of common sense. It's just common sense. Um, I don't overly rely on that, but they can have some use. There's some use for it. Yeah. But they've been, they've been wrong many times. Yeah. Sure. yeah. The big one I can think of was the sniper, the DC sniper p profile. They had that completely wrong. So it, it's, you gotta just understand it's, it yeah, it's not 100%, you know. But those criminal mind goals, those are good, right? They solved their cases, practically, <laughs> practically on the plane on the way there. Yeah. Yeah. But don't you, don't you, what I get upset about, which I had to stop watching Criminal Mind, because for me it got really sick. Um, that it, it actually feeds information to people who are not well in the society and actually can contribute to uh, criminal. I wouldn't worry about that. Right? If mm -hmm. you're going to be a criminal, you're a criminal. You don't think it can give no. ideas to people? No. Not really. It's only on one month. I think, huh? Next season. It's it's last, season. last season. It was the last season? season. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that these people that are pre predisposed to do these things are the people that are right. going to do this. I don't think uh, somebody sitting there going, oh, I could, you know, poison someone this way. I mean, I, I don't think so. But, I mean, is it possible? Yeah, somebody could get an idea. Like, if I want to kill someone, I might say, gee, that's a great idea. Like, I thought that for me, the best way to do it would be to push someone off a cliff, if you think about it. Because it's, boop. Right? Where's all the evidence? <laughs> you know? You just touch them briefly. 
right? So push off a cliff or p throw them off a balcony of a cruise ship, right? We'll visit you. We'll visit you. And, and by the way, that, <laughs> nobody goes near me on the, on the ban 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 banister when I go on cruises, by the way. It's a <laughs> true story. I'm always like, come over, come over, take a look. They, 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 we're good, Mike, we're good, we're good. We're good. But that's a good way. The only problem is a lot of the cruise ships have cameras. cameras <coughs> so you've got to be careful. There are certain blind spots. Look, I know all these things. So just be careful. That's why mountain wouldn't have that. Mountain is better. Cliff, like you're going to go to Yellowstone. Let's go on an adventure. <laughs> what kind of adventure? We're going to go hiking they this amazing on, mountain. Uh, I don't remember them. Chad McBride, Frank, pushed his wife off the cliff. I think I might have seen that one. But that, it's a good way to do it. No cameras, you're in the woods. Of course, it's a Y50, it's a 5 oh. Gosh. So. All right, well, listen, I'm glad you guys all came, and thank you so much.